Hi everyone, um, this is very, very strange. This is really weird. I am sitting in my dining room uh, doing a lecture, right? So um, yeah, bear with me, stick with this. This is gonna be the 20th century's newspapers lecture just before I actually begin going through the slides today. Let me just tell you a little bit about what uh, is gonna happen with this module. Um, obviously I'm going to do this lecture, I'm going to do the television lecture, Reese is going to do the computers lecture and that'll be it. That'll be the end of the module then. Um, you will get an announcement about the exam fairly soon. Uh, plans are being put in place. But bear with me for the time being and I will email you when the time is right just to let you know what's going on with the exam. Um, the first assignment which obviously covers the first six weeks of the module that is not going to change that submission date will be on April the 1st but if for whatever reason you are say in quarantine or something like that or you're traveling a long distance and you're not going to be able to get it done this is what you need to do you need to email the college office so that email address is COA college office that's all one word at swansea.ac.uk send them an email and they will grant you an extension they're pretty much granting extensions now uh, if you've got any kind of adverse circumstances but i advise you to do that as soon as possible i'll put this in an email as well so uh, you don't miss out so today 20th century newspapers you can see from the first slide here freddie stein my hamster from the sun what a journal the sun is what a wonderful thing and what a time to be alive that the sun still exists uh, what I want to do today is talk you through the history of the 20th century newspapers and why they've become so critically important in the British context in particular. So, we've already done newspapers, newspapers up to the late 19th century. Uh, some of you are doing an essay on that. I've seen some essays that people are doing on it and they're looking good. That era was defined by a fight against censorship, freedom of the press and political representation. Uh, the idea that the bourgeois... Uh, middle class that developed in the Industrial Revolution in the UK set up their own press in order to represent their own political views. And indeed, you're the extension then of the radical press emerging at the same time as well to express the views of the newly formed proletariat class as well. The 20th century is a very different story. What happens in the 20th century is an era which is defined much more about commercialism, a new model for funding the press and the media in general and um, an idea of a change in journalistic ideals over that time to match the market that has been set up by newspapers. So by the late 19th century what do we have? We have large-scale industrialization of the press with new technology, capitalization of the press. Now what I mean by that is that the press has largely become now a capital intensive industry. In order to be involved in the press, as we remember from the lecture on newspapers in week two, the idea of having small scale, you know, poorly funded press disappears in the 19th century. And we go towards this um, sort of consolidation of the press in the hands of very wealthy, very rich individuals. In line with that, journalism itself starts to change and you start to get lighter human interest journalism and indeed the emergence of a journalistic profession itself, journalists as a job and a role. Journalists still in the 19th century have this professional ideal of objectivity, impartiality, etc., holding government to account. In the 20th century, that will remain, but journalism as a profession will become more market oriented and will become perhaps less objective and much more subjective over time. Sorry about that, I had to go and get my uh, glass of cola. So I just had to hit pause for a second. So, key figure in the 20th century newspaper industry is Alfred Harmsworth. Publisher of the Daily Mail. Uh, the Daily Mail emerges um, on the 4th of May 1896. As we well know, the Daily Mail still exists today. Not my favourite newspaper and uh, not my favourite website either. Um, in fact, the whole thing is awful and terrible and yeah, let's not get into it right now. 
Harmsworth's influence on the newspaper industry cannot be underestimated. A hugely important figure. So his contributions really revolve around the production of and the business and economic model for the press, which dominates to this day, albeit that economic model is now in serious trouble. So the Daily Mail becomes a mass circulation daily newspaper. So for half a penny, the busy man's daily journal, marketed to all classes of individuals for a very cheap selling price. So by 1900, four years after its launch, selling 989,000 copies a day, and by 1902, goes over the million mark. And what you gotta remember is, for each copy of the newspaper sold, you have more people reading the newspaper. You know, one person will buy it and will take it home. So maybe two or three people will read it. If it's bought for a workplace, several people are going to read it. The emergence of the Daily Mail as a mass circulation daily newspaper then leads to the emergence of the Daily Express and the Daily Mirror in 1900 and 1903, respectively. <coughs> The Express lags behind the mail for a long time, but it uh, takes off after 1916 and became known for its crusading journalism and political opinions, which is a real irony in this day and age because the Daily Express today is an absolute joke of a newspaper that is obsessed with still Princess Diana and uh, immigrants and how bad the weather is. And that's basically the three headlines that they always have. The Daily Mirror was originally launched for women uh, and was an illustrated publication, a fully illustrated publication, the first fully il illustrated newspaper. Um, the Mirror changes a lot over time, but I'll come back to uh, the importance of the Mirror when we hit like the 1960s. So the Mirror, successful emphasis on photography, this idea, so we've got a like, crossover in the module here. So the emergence of photography, as we know, photography becomes an extremely important medium in the, um, late part of the 19th century and the Daily Mirror capitalizes on this and you can see on the slide there that um, front cover of a presidential election in the United States fully illustrated all images very clear, clear visual design and layout easy to absorb any information from the Daily Mirror the start of what we call tabloid press the idea that you know there's very very um, clear messages given out in a very simplistic style by a particular newspaper and very populist. So the Mail, Mirror, and uh, Express they dominate the market up to the start of World War One, which is in 1914. And by 1918, the end of World War One, and we can see a Daily Mirror copy here of um, November the 12th in 1918, so the day after the Armistice Day. Total circulation of newspapers, 3.1 million a day. So it's a huge number of uh, newspapers being sold per day. So we look at the numbers in the 19th century, and even when Harmsworth starts with the Daily Mail in 1896, by 1918, so we're talking 22 years later, we've gone from very small circulation numbers to 3.1 million a day. Huge revenue, and of course, huge reach in terms of audience. And it goes hand in hand with technological improvements as well. So the press, becomes more automated, quicker to use, um, more efficient, so you can produce more copies cheaper. So you get faster drying ink, rail and van distribution improves. So the whole entire distribution of the newspaper network becomes better and therefore sales improve at the same time. Again, like I was saying with regards to the um, cinema last week, um, War is incredibly important for the newspapers. So in Britain, it's no surprise that in the period where you see the launch of the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, the Boer War of 1899 to 1902, that becomes a huge seller with regards to newspapers. And indeed, the First World War will become a massive seller, although there's major censorship of what happens in the war during that time as well. So the coverage of the Boer War in 1902 is characterised to a lot of graphics, a lot of imagery, a lot of photography, a lot of comment pieces, a lot of patriotic coverage, virtually propaganda style coverage, which these newspapers embrace and recognize is very, very important for sales. So the mass circulation dailies, that's a Harmsworth thing. Secondly, the major innovation of Alfred Harmsworth catering to popular tastes. So the Daily Mail used popular human interest content and short digestible and interesting news items. Weirdly, that formula has not changed for that newspaper over time. 
albeit it <sighs> the type of news that it covers now the daily mail is different but it still has this kind of mix basically a very much a tabloid style of journalism emphasizing human interest and sensation aimed at the lower middle classes and a family audience lower middle class working class the sort of upper middle classes and the upper classes are catered to by different newspapers like the times for example but the daily mail looks for the mass market so very bright very entertaining coverage limited political coverage very partisan political coverage but very limited in style so very much about diversion rather than anything else so harmsworth what happened to him well he became ennobled he became a lord he became lord northcliffe in 1904 and really became the first british press baron owning a lot of newspapers so from the daily mail he picks up the daily mirror the sunday dispatch the evening news but the Observer and the Times, for example, as well, to try to actually capitalize and consolidate the entire newspaper industry. You might ask, okay, Leighton, why did he do that? Well, because there's money in those newspapers. A huge amount of money, in fact. So Harmsworth, and what I was saying earlier about capitalization of the industry, Harmsworth is very aware of the notion of capitalization. Harmsworth's entire business model is built on successively trying to accumulate more newspapers over time to consolidate the market. But in order to do that, he needs to maximize the profits of all the newspapers that he has in the first place. So it's almost like nobody else can get into the game because this guy's stable of newspapers is so large he can basically pick up anything. So the Northcliffe Revolution, as we call it, um, which is really his major major we, we kind of group his influence under um is the responsibility you know he's responsible for changing the entire newspaper industry economics basically his behavior in consolidating the industry into his ownership basically made newspapers and along with the changes in industrialization and the changes in production meant that newspapers were now too expensive for anyone but the very wealthy to own. They basically became too expensive to produce because the technology involved, the amount of people that you needed, and I'm not just talking journalists here, I'm talking people who work in production, so printers, people who work in distribution. There's a, you have a huge industry here, and in order to even get a foothold in that industry, you need to be incredibly, uh, in industry, you need to be incredibly wealthy. Um, so much so though, and so complex and so expensive does this become that you can no longer rely on actual newspaper sales to fund the industry itself. North, if Northcliffe had relied just on his, you know, pennies for the Daily Mail, he would have gone bankrupt. So, the Northcliffe Revolution involves a complete transferal and complete uh, revolution in the way that the industry is funded. So his solution to the cost element of this was to sell actually below the cost of the newspaper. Sell as much as you can and use in human interest stories to build up circulation and then sell the readership to advertisers. So what Northcliffe did in his revolution, which is incredibly important, is change the dynamic of who the customer for the newspaper actually is. At one, at one level, you have the readers who are the customers. And we can still accept that, you know, the readership is, a, you know, these people are customers of the newspaper, they're paying for the newspaper. But he's got a secondary set of customers for his business at this point as well, the advertisers. So you have on each newspaper, you have visible audited circulation figures. And basically he used to sell advertising in his newspapers on costs based on per 1,000 readers. So if you're selling a million copies a day, per 1,000 readers, you, you know, if you're an advertiser, I've got to get my product out there, I'm selling something, I want to get it out into as many hands as possible, I need to advertise effectively. Ooh, here's the Daily Mail. Wow, here's a circulation of over a million copies per day. This is where I'm going to put my product. Fantastic. This doesn't just involve a change in business model, but it involves a change in the layout of the newspaper itself. So you actually see the newspaper layout change completely. And it's interesting, if you pick up a newspaper, even if you pick up something like the Metro, right, a free newspaper, 
turn to page seven. I guarantee you page seven is full of advertising. This is a sort of set of rules for the layout of newspapers, which has been in place since Northcliffe, Northcliffe's times. And it continues to be the dominant mode of newspaper production to this day as well. The Sun loses lots of money, but its primary business is not actually the readership. It is advertising itself. The reason why it loses money is because advertising revenue is dropping. Again, I'll come to that towards the end of this lecture. So basically Northcliffe's revolution involves shifting the industry to a reliance on advertising. No longer producing a newspaper, but producing a mass audience. Producing an audience of massive readers to be sold to advertisers. And basically advertisers from this point in time become incredibly important within the newspaper industry, influencing the type of content that newspapers produce. So like newspapers lose a sense of objectivity with this new uh, method. So tabloid style human interest papers delivering mass lower income readership, that becomes the model. That's what you want as a newspaper owner. You want to hit that sweet spot so you can sell as much advertising as possible. You still have a broadsheet press you know, delivering very small but an economically important readership and they have because of that, a very unique position in advertising as well. And you tend to get more high class, more high end products being advertised in those newspapers. Anything in between those two points, though, becomes increasingly squeezed over time throughout the 20th century. And this is kind of the point where we're at today, where you have a very small and very small in circulation broadsheet market in the UK. We have the Guardian, you have the Times, you have the Telegraph. And then you have a mass of lower market newspapers and the mid market. I mean, I guess the Daily Mail and the Daily Express would say they're mid market newspapers. That's not really true. Um, they're much more lower class than that. But it, we have a polarization, basically, the industry between these two different poles between go for as many readers as possible and go as high class as possible. The concentration of ownership between 18, uh, 1918 and 1939 is incredibly important in the development of the press. So you, during this post-World War I period up to World War II, huge soaring of sales over that time, but a very much a loss of diversity as newspapers become consolidated in the hands of very, very few rich, wealthy men. So a lot of success for a small number of titles owned by these kind of wealthy family groups. By 1914, Northcliffe owned 40% of the national morning newspapers, 45% of the evening press and 15% of the Sunday press. And when he died in 1922 and, gave, and um, took over, the business was taken over by his brother, Harold Harmsworth, that had even intensified further. They owned more newspapers, they consolidated further. So this concentration of ownership is actually a very dangerous thing because you have newspapers concentrated in the hands of a very limited number of people who can still use their newspapers to further their own ends in terms of politics. And that becomes apparent as we move forward. So that business, the, this is when Beaverbrook takes over from his brother Harms, when, so when Harold Harms with Lord Beaverbrook, uh, sorry, let me go back a second. Um, so when the business is consolidated further, thank you. Thanks for bearing with me over that little bit. I just lost my words for a second. Controlling 100 weeklies and monthlies and four dailies, the Evening Mail, Daily Mail, Daily Mirror and the Times. Rothmere then sold the Times to the Astor family and Max Aiken, uh, Lord Beaverbrook, who owned the Express and the Evening Standard, but would um, also start to take over things. So the press barons do start to sort of trade newspapers between one another in this period. Think of newspapers at this time as like wealthy men's playthings, you know, um, and these uh, papers trade hands over and over, um, obviously for huge sums of money um, in order to gain different levels of political influence. We see that, uh, you know, Churchill with Beaverbrook, for example. Basically, in the age of the press baron, what you have is very wealthy, ennobled, so we're talking about lords uh, owning newspaper groups. Um, these people, you might ask, well, why are they lords? What, what, what happened there? Well, in order, obviously, to be on the right side of the press, politicians would give knighthoods 
and lordships to the people who own newspapers to keep them on side. So these people gain huge political importance during this period thanks to the consolidation of the press in those hands. The press barons are very much interventionist and controlling owners, very much in the business of overruling editors, imposing their own views and character on the papers, whilst making this fallacious claim to be speaking for the people. Again, this is a feature of press ownership today as well. You, you get like um, the Sun, for example, is you know, the voice of working class Britain. The Sun is owned by Rupert Murdoch, an Australian American billionaire. He is not working class, he's never been working class, but his newspaper somehow is the voice of working class Britain. This is not a new thing, this was going on you know, in the middle part of the last century. These uh, press owners usually have aspirations of political influence and even during this time are very much criticised for the influence that they would have on the public, the influence that they would use their newspapers to express their political views as being the views of the public and try to convince people of the sort of correctness of their views. In terms of political influence, there's a number of examples of how influential these newspapers were. So during the First World War, Norcliffe uh, Times newspaper reports a shell crisis. And what I mean by reports with tenacity keeps on reporting about this shell crisis, keeps on reporting that Britain is actually not producing enough in terms of armaments and munitions for the war. That campaign brings down Asquith's wartime government, Asquith the Prime Minister at the start of the world, First World War. Now when Lloyd George became, David Lloyd George, the last Welsh Prime Minister, became Prime Minister in 1916, he made Northcliffe as Director of Propaganda for his government and Beaverbrook became a minister. So he basically enrolled the press barons into the wartime government to keep them on side and to have some kind of influence over what the press was doing. But at the same time, of course, now you have people who own newspapers sitting in government at a time of global war. So it's an incredible scenario, basically, that newspaper owners were able to use their newspapers to take down government and basically buy a seat at the top table and influence wartime policy making. You know, it, um, it kind of staggering, really, uh, how democracy was subverted by the newspapers during the First World War. Another great example, probably the classic example of the early part of the 20th century of political influence, is the Zinoviev letter. This um, comes around after the collapse of the first Labour government, led by uh, uh, Keir Hardy. No, was it Kiyadi? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, that's why our building is named the way it is, right? So um, after the collapse of the first Labour government in uh, October 1924, with an election in 1924 uh, to elect a new government. So the Labour government can no longer govern, basically it uh, doesn't have the numbers in Parliament anymore to pass any policy, so call a general election. Um, and the Zinoviev letter was published four days before that general election a claim that this letter was from a Soviet politician and promoting revolution in England uh, through this through this Soviet politician writing to try and start a civil war in Britain to start a communist revolution. So you have the Daily Mail publishing what is apparently a letter from Moscow to the Labour Party, ordering the Labour Party to start a revolution on the basis, you know, on the same kind of lines as the Soviet revolution in Russia in 1917. Um, okay, well, that's kind of important. That's huge, right? That's massive. You know, the Soviet Union commanding the Labour Party in Britain to start a communist revolution. Wow, this is massive stuff. So the letter was purported to be from uh, Grigory Zin um Zinoviev, uh, president of the Comintern, the internal communist organization, uh, and called on British communists to mobilize sympathetic forces in the Labour Party to support an Anglo-Soviet treaty and to courage agitation pro propaganda in the armed forces. Um, basically, 
to start the beginning of a civil war in England, uh, which would lead to a revolution, which would lead to a the formation of a communist state. Uh, hugely embarrassing to the Labour Party, obviously, the publication of this letter. The Conservatives won the election with Stanley Baldwin becoming the new um, Prime Minister. And unsurprisingly, the letter was a forgery. There, no such letter, no such communication existed. This was a letter forged by anti-communist Russians who were also anti-Labour Party in the, U in, uh, the UK. The letter was uh, leaked to the Conservative Party and then the Conservative Party made sure it was leaked and published in the Daily Mail. So, I mean, we know and we use the term so regularly that we live in a time of fake news. Here's your classic example of fake news. A forged letter leaked by the security services to politicians who then make sure it goes in a newspaper four days before general election. So it goes in the biggest newspaper in the country four days before general election and surprise, surprise, the general election is won by the Conservative Party. Kind of bonkers, guys.